So, good afternoon. So, uh, <clears throat> last time we have been started to talk about rings. So, we introduced rings and uh, talked about uh, subrings and units and so on. So, it was all rather elementary. So, now I will just proceed. <coughs> um, so, in particular, we want to I start by introducing division rings and fields. So, uh, so the first is a definition a ring with the so a unitary ring, so a ring R with one is called a division ring. Well, if every non zero element is invertible. So if um, R star is equal to R without zero. So R star, I recall, was the multiplicative group of units, so the elements which are invertible for the multiplication. So every non zero element has an inverse. So <coughs> uh, we will, in a moment, not really deal with the division rings. So we are more interested in the commutative division rings, which are called fields. So a commutative division ring is a field. So <coughs> the last third or so of this uh, course will be devoted to fields, in particular to uh, field extensions. So that means you have one field sitting, a smaller field sitting inside a bigger one. Um, <coughs> so I, I will write explicitly once again the, the axioms for a field so that we, uh, you know, because uh, so that we have them once together. So that means uh, a set R together with uh, two binary operations so which are addition from um, R times R to R and multiplication from R times R to R is called a field. Well, <coughs> so two binary operations and two distinguished elements. So zero, which is different from one. So two elements, zero and one, which are different from each other, is called a field. If first, the addition, so R together with the plus, is a, a commutative ring with neutral element zero. A commutative group. was part of the definition of a ring. So second one is that if I take R without zero with the multiplication, this is a commutative group with neutral element one. And secondly, these two structures have to be somehow compatible, and this is by the distributive law. So let 
which just says that if I take A times B plus C, this is equal to AB plus AC for all ABC and R. Okay? So this is the definition of a field. As I said later, we will uh, study this a little bit more. <coughs> um, for now, so you know a few fields. You know, we have um, Q, so the rational numbers, uh, the real numbers, and the complex numbers are fields. Um, I want to uh, also show that there are some finite fields. Um, and for this, I uh, so a fi fields with finitely many elements. For this, I show that every uh, finite integral domain is a field. So proposition. Every finite integral domain is a field. So recall that uh, an integral domain is a commutative ring with one, which has no zero divisors. So there are no two non-zero elements whose product is zero. And we want to show that such a thing is a field, so that in such a thing, every non-zero element is invertible for the multiplication. So, so what we have to show, as it is already a commutative ring, we have to show that uh, it is uh, that the units are R without zero. So in other words, we have to take a non-zero element in R and have to find its inverse. So we have to find its inverse element. Well, so we look at this distributive law. So the distributive law says which we have in any ring says that A so now for this given A times B plus C is equal to A B plus A C. So in other words that means if we take the map of multiplying by A from R to R, which sends an element B to A times B. This map is a group homomorphism for the addition on R. From R plus to R plus. Because it says precisely that. If I, mark, if I apply this map to B plus C, it's a cell the same as if I first apply it to B and then to C and take the sum in R. OK, so it's a group homomorphism. And we know that um, uh, R has no zero divisors. So in particular, uh, there is there is no uh, say C in R without zero, such that A times C is equal to zero. Obviously, A times zero is equal to zero. In other words, if I take this group homomorphism, then its kernel consists only of zero. Kernel. 
Okay, if you have a group homomorphism, homomorphism whose kernel is just zero, it means it's injective. And now <coughs> we use uh, the property that uh, this is a finite integral domain. If you have a finite set and you have a map from this finite set to itself, which is injective, then it must also be surjective because you have as many elements on both sides, sometimes called the pigeonhole principle. So as R is finite, if the map is injective from R to itself, it must be bijective. In particular, if I take the element 1 in R, this must lie in the image. So let B an element in R with A times B is equal to 1. Well, and this, so this exists because the map is bijective, particularly surjective, so it means B is equal to A to the minus 1. And so we have found an inverse for our element, uh, for any, our non-zero element. And so it means that every non-zero element is a unit. OK, so <coughs> this gives us, we already know some finite integral domains, because we had seen that uh, if we take uh, Z P, where P is a prime number, um, we know that this is an integral domain. And so and thus it is a field. And it has uh, with p elements. So for every prime number p, we have this field with p elements. And um, later we will see that for every prime power p to the n, there is a field with p to the n elements. And uh, we will soon introduce the notion of isomorphism and homomorphism of rings and fields. And, uh, then we will find that for every prime power p to the n, there is a unique field with p to the n elements up to isomorphism. But as we will see later. OK. So now we want to come to ring homomorphisms. So it's the usual thing whenever you introduce uh, sets with a structure. You're interested in homomorphisms between them, which means maps between such sets which are compatible with the structure. Now, for a group, the structure was the multiplication. And so the homomorphism must be a map between the groups which is compatible with the multiplication. And for a field, for a ring, you have two operations, addition and multiplication, so it must be compatible with both. So, <coughs> so we talk about ring homomorphisms. So definition. So let A and B be rings. So a map phi from A to B is called a ring homomorphism if it's compatible with addition and multiplication. So it sends the sum to the sum and the product to the product. So if for all A and B 
in, in A, we have phi of A plus B is equal to phi of A plus phi of B. Here's the sum in A, here's the sum in B. And phi of A times B is equal to phi of A times phi of B. Okay, that seems the obvious definition to make. And then we have the same words that we used for, for homomorphisms of groups. So the, the image uh, of phi is uh, uh, phi of A, so just the image as a map, and the, the kernel of phi is the kernel of phi, which is defined to be the inverse image, image of the zero element of B. So if you have a ring homomorphism, it's in, it, it's in particular a homomorphism of commutative groups, if you just take the addition on both sides, and then the kernel is the same as the kernel was for this group homomorphism between the additive groups. So, and uh, say, a bijective ring homomorphism as usual is a ring isomorphism. And if you have a, uh, an isomorphism from a ring to itself, it's called automorphism. Phi from A to A is an automorphism. Okay, I mean, this is a bit small, but anyway, it's the obvious thing. <coughs> so, now, as I just said, we have made, have just defined the kernel to be the kernel of the uh, homomorphism of the additive groups. So, <coughs> so, um, Mark um, so a ring homomorphism so from phi from A to B is in particular um uh, a group homomorphism between the additive groups P from A with the addition to B with the addition and uh, by definition the kernel is the same as the kernel of this group homomorphism thus is injective if and only if the kernel of phi is equal to zero because that we know for the group homomorphisms of the additive group. And then as usual, I don't really even write it down, the, if you have an, a ring isomorphism, then it's straightforward to see that the inverse map is also a ring isomorphism and the composition of ring homomorphisms is ring homomorphism. Um, and last time I introduced the notion of a subring. So we also have that if um, uh, phi from A to B is a ring homomorphism and its image 
is a subring of P. This is uh, essentially directly from definition. So it just means it's a subgroup of the additive group and the product of any two elements also lies in it. That was the definition of a subring. And this is, uh, your, this is straightforward to check. If you want, you can check it as an exercise. So <clears throat> if you remember, when we were talking about groups, we had that the, uh, uh, the image of a group homomorphism is a subgroup. And the kernel of a group homomorphism is also a subgroup, but it's something better, namely a normal subgroup. And something similar is true here. If you have the kernel of a ring homomorphism, it's also a subgroup. But it's something better, namely an ideal. And so we want to introduce that now. Definition. So let R be a ring. So a subset I in R is called an idea, is called an ideal, or is an ideal if uh, the following holds. First, it's a subgroup for the additive group. So the sum of any two elements in I lies in I, and also the negative for any element. So if you want just the difference of any two elements in I lies in I. And the second statement is something more than for a uh, subgroup, namely for all, say, uh, x in i and all a in r, we have that uh, x times a is in i, and a times x is in i. So to be a, a, a subring of r, we would have to know this for all x and a in i. We need x, a is in i. So this is a weaker condition. So in particular, so in particular, an ideal is a suffering. But it's something better. So for the moment, um, so typical, so example, so say you can have the set zero is an ideal and if I take the whole of R this is an ideal in R this is basically obvious from the definitions let's now uh, see what I just said before that the uh, I didn't write it, I just said it, that the kernel of a ring homomorphism is an ideal. So let me state that lemma. Let um, phi from A to B be a ring homomorphism. Ah, maybe I should say that, um, so here I've, you know, as I'm not assuming that the ring is commutative at this stage. These two conditions are two different conditions, and I require them both. So that's for me an ideal. So in some bo books, uh, you call that a two-sided ideals, because you know 
multiplying on both sides, uh, you still are in I. And then you also have left ideals and right ideals. But we will not be concerned with left ideals and right ideals. We are only concerned with, with uh, you know, two-sided ideals like this. And actually soon we will restrict our attention to commutative rings where it makes no difference anyway. So, so let phi from A to B be a ring homomorphism. Then the kernel of phi is an ideal in A. More generally, if I is an ideal in B, then its inverse image is an ideal in A. So first, it should be clear that this first statement follows from the second, because I've just told you, and it's anyway obvious, that 0 is an ideal in, in B. So, uh, you know, I just apply to this, I get that the kernel, which the inverse image of 0, is an ideal in A. So now I have only to show the second statement. Let's take our ideal in B. And we just have to check the definition. So as um, I is a subgroup of uh, the additive group of B, its inverse image is a subgroup of the additive group of A by what we have learned when we did groups. So we only have to show this second condition. So let uh, x be an element in phi to the minus 1 of i. And uh, let a be element in a. So we have to show that ax and xa are in i. And we have shown that it's an idea. So if we take phi, this kind of, you know, if we take phi of Ax, as it's a ring homomorphism, this is phi of A times phi of X. This is phi of X is, a, you know, phi maps x to an element in i, that's what's written here. So this is an element in i. And I multiply it with any, <coughs> I multiply it with any element. So phi of a is some element in a. But as this is an ideal, it follows that this lies in i. And similarly, uh, phi of x a element i. So it's basically obvious and so this was this statement. So the inverse image of an ideal. Maybe uh, I, X and X are in the Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, certainly. That's what I obviously meant. And I should also have written that. So here it's okay. And so uh, 
uh, a x in phi to the minus 1 of i and x a in phi to the minus 1 of i. OK, thank you. So I want to say a slightly more precise description to compare the ideals. If you have a subjective ring homomorphism, I want to compare the ideals, uh, say, in A and B, if the ring homomorphism goes from A to B. It's, again, a rather simple thing, but it's useful to no, sometimes. <coughs> Lemma. So let the uh, phi, phi from A to B be a subjective ring homomorphism. an ideal in B to its inverse image is a bijection from uh, the ideals in B to the ideals in A which contain the kernel of phi. So we can describe all the ideals in B in terms of some of the ideals in A, namely those which contain the kernel. This is actually quite simple. We can write down the inverse map, namely just taking the image of an ideal under phi. So we define the inverse map. So this is uh, the other way around. So I write again the idea from the ideals in A containing kernel phi to the ideals in A in B. Well, we want to use phi to do it. So the obvious way to do it, the, the most obvious way, we just take the image. So we take an ideal J in A, which contains the kernel of phi, is mapped to its image under phi. So I claim that this is the inverse map to this. So we know that. Uh, so we know that this map sends an ideal in B to an ideal in A, and obviously an ideal in A containing the kernel, because this ideal contains the element 0, and its inverse element contains the inverse image of 0, which is the kernel. So the map does this, and now we want to write down the inverse map. So he has written down the inverse map, and now we want to say they are, see they are inverse to each other. The first thing we might want to see is, however, that it sends, that it actually does what is claimed here, that it sends an ideal in A, which contains a kernel, to the ideal, to an ideal in B. Actually, it sends, uh, OK. So let J be an ideal in uh, A. I don't even need to have that it contains the kernel of phi. Then we want to see that its image is an ideal in B, using that the map is subjective. Um, so to see P of J is an ideal 
in B. Well, that's quite simple. Obviously, we know that phi of j is a subgroup of B with the addition because phi is a group homomorphism for the additive group and j is a subgroup of uh, A. So, okay, so that's fine. So we have to only see that it is com that whenever I multiply with any element of B, I stay there. So let B e in B and Y element in B of J. Then I can write, uh, you know, as the map is subjective, I can write uh, can write B equal to phi of A, where A is in A, and Y equal to phi of X, where X is an element in uh, J. Well, and then obviously, if I take phi of, if I take, uh, say, by, this is equal to phi of a, phi of x, which is the same as phi of ax. <coughs> and so it is in phi of j. Uh, and similarly, y b is an element in phi of j. So we see that the Im if we have a surjective ring homomorphism, the image of an ideal is an ideal. Um, <coughs> so in particular, it holds under our extra assumption that uh, this ideal was supposed to uh, contain the kernel of phi. So now, let J be an idea in A, which we round to want to go. No, first, let I be an ideal uh, so. We want now to show that this map is the inverse map. So we have to show that both compositions of this map with this map in both directions are the identity. So now we take I an ideal in A. In, uh, do you want this? Yeah. No, let I be an ideal in B. Then if we take phi of phi of to the minus one of i, this is obviously equal to i. In fact, that's, uh, uh, that's true for any subset of B. You know, it's just the property of being, you know, this means all, this is the set of all elements which map to elements in I. And then I map, apply phi to it, so I get I. You know? This is uh, by definition without any assumptions on what I is. Obviously. And conversely, let uh, J be an ideal in A containing the kernel. of phi. And then we have to, then it's, again, the following is clear. If we take the phi to the minus 1 of phi of j, this will contain j. Again, this is true regardless of what j is. If I have any subset uh, of A, then phi to the minus 1 of phi of it is, contains the set. Because again, just by definition of phi to the minus 1. These are all the elements in, uh, in A which map to elements in the image of J. 
in other words. And so certainly any element of J lies inside the set. Because, uh, you know, that's again just the definition. So we have to see the other inclusion. So let. Uh, so which one do I want to? Want? So let Z be an element in phi to the minus one of phi of j. We have to show. So we want to show the other inclusion. Then we are done. So we have to show that the Z actually lies in J. Well, obviously, if it's the fact that it lies in the inverse image of phi of J means uh, that if I take phi of Z, this is an element in phi of J. That means there exists an element uh, x in J such that phi of z is equal to phi of x. That's what it means to lie in the image of J. Actually, Okay, so if I take phi of x minus of c minus x, so if I take so phi of z minus phi of x, we know that this is zero because they are equal. So this is phi of z minus x. So it means that z minus x is an element in the kernel of phi, which we know is contained in J, because that was our assumption. So thus, we can write Z, which was our element, which we wanted to show is in J. We can write this as uh, x plus Z minus x. And uh, this is an element in J. This is an element in J. So this is an element in J. So our element Z is in J. So we find that phi to the minus one of phi of J is equal to J. And which means that this map is inverse to this. And so they are bijective to each other. OK. OK, so this is not. Uh, uh, this is again a quite elementary uh, thing. So today, I mostly do very simple things, but you know, one also has to. I just start again slowly, and then we come to more slightly more interesting things later, but not really today. So <coughs> another thing that one has is uh, we had defined the subgroup generated by some elements. So we can also look at the ideal generated by some elements in a ring, which is in some sense easier. So definition, let R be a ring. And um, um, say A1 to An some elements in R. The idea generated by them by is just so it's denoted like we had denoted the subgroup generated by it, but uh, always be clear from the context which one we mean. In this case, it's just a set of all linear combinations of these elements with coefficients in R. So this is the set of all A1, R1 plus, plus An, Rn. Ah, 
Yeah, so I was not, so I want this to be a commutative ring because otherwise this will not work. Mm. And we have our elements A1 to An in R. So we have this. We look at all these linear combinations where the Ri are elements in R. So we just look at all these linear combinations. And so, um, so it's easy to see. It's really trivial. This is an idea. In R of uh, the simplest case is obviously that this ideal is generated by only one element. So, so for A in R, the set uh, so A, the ideal generated by this one element, which I could also just write as A times R. The set of all A R with R in R. A will be called the principal ideal generated by A. For instance, uh, in in Z, we have uh, n, which is just equal to n Z, uh, now which are all elements divisible by Z. So, uh, n divides m. We will see later that in Z, all ideals are principal ideals. So every ideal can be written as an ideal generated by just one element. And the ring with this property will be called the principal ideal ring. But uh, as I said, we'll see that later. So just one stupid remark. So, so for security, say let R be an integral domain. So we say that uh, we find that the principal ideal generated by an element, uh, by two different elements, will be the same if they only differ by multiplication by a unit. So let uh, A and B be elements in R, then the ideal generated by A is equal to the general ideal generated by B. If and only if. There is a unit, so an invertible element for the multiplication, u in r with b equal to u times a. So it's easy to decide when two principal ideals are equal. But that's, uh, again, basically obvious. So if A is equal to B, uh, then it means in particular that B lies in the ideal generated by A, so it's a multiple of A, then B is equal to UA for some 
u in R. The only thing we have to see is that this u is a unit. Well, we also have that A lies in the ideal generated by B. So we also have that A is equal to W times B for some B, for some uh, W in R. So if we put this in here, we have that B is equal to uh, W. So to u times a, and a is equal to w times b. But as we are in a, an integral domain, we can cancel the factor b. So it follows that 1 is equal to u times w. And so this means that uh, w is the inverse of u, and u is a unit. So this shows uh, this direction. This direction we have to is in some sense even obvious if uh, they are related in this way. We want to say that this uh, that they generate the same element. Conversely, if B is equal to U A with U a unit. Well, first, B lies in the ideal generated by A, because it's, it is A multiplied by something. So the ideal generated by B consists of all elements of R which you obtain by multiplying B by something. But these are then also. Uh, I can also, that means I can also multiply the, so this is all W times B, so, but it's all the same as all W times B. So it follows that the ideal generated by B is contained in the ideal generated by A. And now, <coughs> obviously, if B is equal to UA, then A is equal to U to the minus 1 B. And so we can change the role of A and B. So also A is equal to U to the minus 1 B plus A is contained. So first, yeah, A is an element in B and thus a is contained in the ideal generated by B. OK, this was another simple remark. Okay. So then we want to, um, <coughs> where is it? want to see that the ideals, so in a field, there are essentially no ideals. We know that in any ring, uh, the set consisting of the element 0 and the whole of the ring are ideals. And in a field, the claim is these are the only ones. And this also will lead to the fact that uh, any non-zero homomorphism which starts from a field has to be injective. So let's uh, state this remark. Uh, so let I be an ideal 
in a ring R. So if this ideal contains a unit, then it is the whole of R. Second statement, which uh, is an easy consequence, is that the only ideals in a field so maybe I call it K are zero and K. And the third, which is a consequence of that, is that so let K be a field. And assume we have a homomorphism from k to any ring. A homomorphism to a ring R. Uh, then uh, either phi is injective or phi is the zero map. So by this I mean that phi of x is equal to zero for all x and k or phi is injective. So this is all very simple, actually. So <coughs> let's do the first one. So, so assume we have such an element which lies in I and is a unit. So let A be an element I, which is also a unit. Um, so, so <coughs> you know, I is an ideal so uh, so the inverse element of A lies in R so if I take A to the minus 1 times A uh, this will lie in I because the product of an element in I with an element in R. But this is equal to 1. We find that the element 1 lies in I, and so thus, if uh, I take any element x in R, then I can write x equal to x times 1, and so this is now a product of an element in R with an element in I, and so this is an element in I. Okay, so this is the first one. Second one is a direct consequence. We know, I mean, we use that the units in a field are precisely all the elements in the field which are not zero. This is the definition of a field. Um, and so if I if I have an ideal which does not only consist of the element 0, it cons contains a, a unit, and therefore it is equal to the whole of k. So this uh, follows directly from 1. And the third one is um, a direct consequent of 2, because um, you know, the kernel of phi is an ideal in k. And thus, either the kernel of phi is equal to 0, which means phi is injective, or the kernel of phi 
is equal to the whole of k. It's the only other idea, which means phi is the zero map. Okay. So when we were discussing uh, uh, normal subgroups, one thing uh, that one could do with normal subgroups was that you could take the quotient group by the normal subgroup. So the set of cosets by this uh, normal subgroup was naturally a group. And so, as I kind of said, the uh, ideals are somehow analogous to the normal subgroups in a group. So we also want to uh, take the quotient of a ring by an ideal and see that that is also a ring. So let me do this. So we know, I mean, part of the definition of a ring is that the additive group of the ring is a commutative group. So R, comma plus, is commutative. So I, which is a subgroup of R, comma plus, is a normal subgroup. So we do have the quotient group for the addition. So thus we have the quotient group. R mod i, which consists of all the cosets with respect to i. So this i. Right, additively, this is a set of all x plus i with x in R, where x plus i is just a, another word for the equivalence class. It's also the equivalence class of x. for the equivalence relation as we had it before for the groups that x is equivalent to y if and only if um, the difference is an element in i. Then the equivalence classes will be precisely these and the set of equivalence classes is this quotient set and this is a group This is, as I said, is a group with um, so x plus i plus y plus i being defined to be x plus y plus i. So in future, however, to simplify. Notation I will always write this just as equivalence class like that. And now we want to show that this thing is also a ring. A, yeah. So I mean I call it 
call it here zero. That's quite large, but maybe good position. So, <coughs> so we have the uh, same situation for R's a ring, and I and R is an ideal. So R mat I uh, with the operations. Uh, so x plus y, this is what we have just written, equal to x plus y, and x times y x y is a ring. So the, <coughs> the zero element will be mass of zero. And um, the natural projection we had the natural projection before, just a map which sends every element to its equivalence class. So pi from R to R mod I, which sends any element x in R to its equivalence class or its coset is a ring homomorphism. So this is very similar to what we did for the groups. It's also not more difficult. We just have to. So essentially, we also have already seen it. So we have seen that uh, um, so that we get an additive group if we just take this uh, sum. And we have to then therefore show that uh, the product is well defined and makes this thing into a ring and that this is a ring homomorphism. So this is a ring homomorphism, and obviously it is a surjective ring homomorphism. That the map is surjective is obvious because this map is obviously surjective. <laughs> okay, poof. Maybe not so high. So by what we have just seen, we have that uh, R mod I together with this addition that we had defined. So we will write it as before, comma with x plus y equal to x plus y is a commutative green ring. Mutative group, and uh, this map pi is a group homomorphism. So from R plus to R dot I plus is a group homomorphism. This we have already seen. Because this we already know from what we did about groups. Um, okay. Maybe I should also say here that this thing has. This homomorphism has obviously as kernel i. So we can, given any idea, we can find a group homomorphism by taking this quotient so that the kernel is that ideal i. And obviously, this is a group homomorphism with kernel i. Because the inverse image of zero is the 
equivalence class of 0 which is i. So, we want to show the product is well defined. So, that means if we have two different representatives uh, for yeah, this class of x and the class of y, we still get the same thing for the product. So, um, if uh, the class of x is equal to the class of x prime and the class of y is equal to the class of y prime. <coughs> then this means in other words that uh, x minus x prime lies in i and y minus y prime lies in i. So then if I have x y minus x prime y prime I can kind of write this in a different way to make sh to show that this difference also lies in i. Maybe I write this as x minus x prime times y minus I hope it's correct anyway you can check this x prime times y prime minus y. Uh, so, anyway, the things that I want is this one, this one, and these two are the same. So, that's okay. And you see that this thing is an element in I, and this thing is an element in I. So, it follows that this whole product lies in I, and this whole product lies in I. So, the whole thing lies in I. That means product of x, the class of product x, y is equal to that for x prime, y prime. So, the product is well defined. Only depends on the equivalence class. And then, you know, to, to see that, uh, <coughs> so the product is well defined. So, to show now that this gives us a, a ring, we have to show associativity and uh, distributivity. So, to show that uh, arm of i is a ring, show associativity, the associative law and the distributive law. Well, this is uh, completely trivial because it follows directly from that in R. So, if I just do it for the associative law, so I want to say if I take A times B times C, by definition, this is A times B C. And this is the same as A, B, C. Now, you can already see that you, we don't remember the brackets anymore. So, it's obviously, anyway, A, B, C. Okay, so it's just uh, moving around these idiotic bracket brackets. So, it's kind of clear. This is the associative law and the distributive law is as simple. And uh, that pi is a ring homomorphism is also obvious. So if I take uh, elements, so for x, y in R, I have pi of x, y. by definition is the class of x times y, which is class of x times set of y, which is pi of x times y.
times pi of y. So this is all trivial. So anyway, so we find this uh, quotient ring. And uh, so if you have an idea, you can divide by the idea. You get a new ring, uh, such uh, which works precisely in the obvious way. OK. So we can, <coughs> if we want um, so in particular, so we have this ring homomorphism from R to R mod I. The kernel is I. So we can therefore describe the ideals that contain I corollary. as projection between the ideals of R mod I and the ideals in R containing I. As we've seen, the projection is given by uh, taking the inverse image of, of the natural projection. OK. Now, finally, how much time? Ah. Finally, want to show uh, also the other thing we showed for groups, so that we have the homomorphism theorem, and we can basically, if we have a homomorphism between rings, and uh, <coughs> uh, then we can divide by any ideal which is contained in the kernel. So theorem. It's again, it's called, it's not really so much of a theorem. But anyway, it's a universal property of the quotient. Property. So let phi from A to B be a ring homomorphism. And do we take an ideal in A, which is contained in the kernel of phi? Then we can, one, could, one says then one can factor the map over the quotient by I or through the quotient by i. So then there's a unique, unique homomorphism uh, phi bar from a mod i to b, such that um, you can either write this as a commutative diagram such that this diagram A phi B, here we have the natural projection to A mod I, and here we have phi bar commutes. This just means if you go this way, same as if you go first down here and then there. So in other words, And uh, we can see furthermore the kernel of phi bar 
is equal to the kernel of phi modulo i. So the quotient by this uh, ideal. And um, the image of r mod i, so the image under phi bar is the same as the image of phi. Well, this it takes much longer to, to state this than actually to prove it. If you look at it, we have imposed this condition that uh, phi bar should satisfy this property that I compose it with phi, with p, then I get phi. But this will determine uh, phi bar for us, so the uniqueness of the homomorphism will be obvious. Namely, so if that phi equal to phi bar composed with pi, this fact means that um, if I take phi bar of any element x, so of any class x, or of any element in A mod i, this has to be, by this formula, equal to phi of x. So if phi bar exists, it is unique. Yeah, because we've written down the formula for it. And obviously, we will use this as a definition. We only have to define to prove it's well defined. We have to show. With this definition, it's well defined. Well, and that's uh, kind of obvious. So if uh, the class of x is equal to the class of y, then as we have seen. Now a few times, x minus y is an element in i, which is contained in the kernel of phi. So it follows that phi of x minus y is equal to 0, which is equal to phi of x minus phi of y. So thus it follows. So it means that this phi bar is well defined. The image of uh, the class depends, does not depend on the representative. We always get the same result. And um, you know it's uh, immediately to check that this is a ring homomorphism. We've done similar things already a couple of times today. You just check that if you take the sum, it maps to the sum. If you take the product, it maps to the product. This follows immediately from the fact that phi is a ring homomorphism. And then it is clear, you know, we have defined phi of an equivalence class to be phi of the representative. So therefore, the image of phi bar is the same as the image of phi. Because every element, you know, you know after all, we just, uh, every element in the image of phi is obtained uh, in this way. We just take any represent, we take the class 
of any for any class. So if we have something which is in the image of phi, we just take the, the equivalence class of that, of the thing it maps to it, and this will map to it under phi bar. So clearly, by definition, phi of r is equal to phi bar of r i. And Basically, also by definition, we have that the class of X is in the kernel of phi bar if and only if phi bar of X is equal to zero, but this is equal to phi of X. Okay. So that means if and only if phi of x is equal to 0 for any, for 1, or equivalently for every representative of x. So this means if and only if. Uh, so if and only if x is in the kernel of phi, which is if and only if class of x is in the kernel of phi, modulo i. because we have just the equivalence classes are just taken by the, the class modulo i. So maybe I can also finish this section by finishing with the homomorphism theorem, which is a straightforward application. says, like with the groups, that if we have a, a subjective ring homomorphism with kernel i, then this gives us an isomorphism of the quotient by i with what you are mapping to. So let phi from a to b be a subjective ring homomorphism. with kernel i. <coughs> then uh, the map phi bar from a mod i to b is an isomorphism. In particular, A mod I is isomorphic to B. And that's basically clear from the universal property. So, proof by the universal property. We have that, um, uh, so this phi bar is, uh, so this map was uh, subjective, so phi bar is a subjective ring homomorphism with kernel. What's the kernel? So the kernel of phi modulo i. Okay, so the zero is i mod i. So the, the kernel is just the zero element of phi of uh, a mod i. So that means it is also injective, so okay. So maybe okay. So maybe here I stop. So I have, um, as you see, today we did not really do 
anything interesting. Maybe I went a little bit fast because of that. I don't know. On the other hand, we, there was no argument which was not very easy. So, um, <coughs> so it's just everything we did is kind of analogous to what we did for the case of groups. And the proofs are very simple, similar. So hope next time it, uh, we will do a little bit more. We will talk about prime ideals and maximal ideals and discrete uh, and uh, principal ideal domains. So anyway, we'll see each other on Friday. <laughs>